you doing wonderful happy Monday we got a lot of business to cover it's gonna be an amazing Monday it's gonna be an amazing week we're just gonna like assign it in an affirmative way that we are gonna have a wonderful week I'm glad that you're sitting here. We're about to take some time to talk about publicity and what it means to start getting some real mainstream publicity in digital publications such as Forbes and Inc. and Entrepreneur and the whole nine yards, Fast Company, any of those that you are looking to be featured in, you're in the right place. And we are going to talk about the right thing. I am live. If you have questions, we're going to actually hope because last time I tried to do this, my screen went down at the same time. We're going to hope that you can actually post your questions. If you're on LinkedIn, you can feel free to post your questions. I can see them. And I'll also just check my phone here and there just to make sure that I actually have answered all of your questions live, but you're in the right place. So I'm just going to get straight to it. Let's be honest with each other. 2020 has been a really rough year. Can we agree? Can we can we agree that 2020 has been a rough year? And if you have any level of expertise, if you are a thought leader, if you are someone who specifically does something that you want a lot of attention toward, and you are getting sick and tired of the normalized um, chat around, well, build your social media, build an audience, do this, do that. If you are kind of a little tired of that right about now, you're in the right place. Because like you, um, once upon a time, I fell for all of those things. I fell for the build your social media, brand this, change your logo, dot, 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 dot. And I did all of that. And um, yeah, it didn't really pan out the way I'd hoped to spend a lot of money. <laughs> it is what it is, right? These are all investments I had to make. And a lot of these uh, investments that I've had to make along this journey have helped me to really see what I needed all along was something that I had the ability to do. And it was to get into mainstream publications that were going to help me to take my expertise to the next level. And so I said this before in my last live, but I'm going to say it again. I have been on both sides of this aisle. I have been featured in almost every publication I can think of. And I have been, I am a writer for Entrepreneur. I am a writer for um, Inc. Magazine. I know what it takes to get in. I know what it takes to get featured. I know what it takes to get quoted. For the sake of our conversation today, I'm going to spend most of our time talking about what it takes to get quoted because I think more than getting featured, because Getting a full feature is hard. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. Unless you have something that is like you've invented the cure for COVID or you've come up with some revolutionary idea, a one person feature is a really tough one. It's possible. I'm not saying it's not, but it, it's really a, a, a tough thing because, uh, you know, you have to pitch this to editors. It's not just me saying yes and that's it. But what it, what it really means is that during this time, during the time of COVID, during the time of a health pandemic, you have to consistently keep publicity going. And the reason is because when this is all over and this is all said and done, who is going to remember who at during this time? It's going to be the people who have had the most amount of eyes and ears on their expertise during this time who are going to revolutionize the way we continue to honor those people. It's gonna raise your value to get in these publications. I have, I have to say, nothing is more um, rewarding than when people offer you money without ever having to ask you <laughs> anything. Or people say, you know, how much do you charge to come to my event? How much do you charge to speak at my event? How much do you charge for um, in a parent? Like things like that. And all of this would not have been possible without mainstream digital media coverage. And you're going to hear my um, lawn guy is coming right here right now. And he has to do the lawn right now. Yeah. He's supposed to be here at four o'clock this morning, but he's coming right now. Anywho, I'm hearing him now. <laughs> Anywho. So I'm going to talk to you about just a few things you need to do. If you saw my last video, 
I talked about what you shouldn't do, but today I'm going to talk to, to you about what you need to do to get to the next level of getting mainstream coverage in either Forbes, Inc., Entrepreneur, Fast Company, and I'll even give you some tidbits about some other publications that I can think of off the top of my head that I've been in. So I said this before, if you did not listen to my last video, I'm saying it again because this is the most important part of this entire conversation that we're going to have, is that you have to know the difference between a contributor and a writer. A contributing writer or guest contributing writer, as some of us are called, and a staff writer. There is a huge, huge difference. And maybe I was a little bit coy when I said it the last time. What is the difference? Okay. I am a contributing writer. I am a contributor. I was asked to be in a lot of these publications because of some level of measured success I have had within my company, be it that it's solvent, be it that we are very public, um, a lot of the partnerships that we have, all of that has contributed to the fact that, con uh, I'm sorry, that staff writers reach out to people like me and say, hey, I've noticed that you have done blank. I noticed that you're connected to blank. I noticed that you are in partnership with blank. I noticed your alliance with blank. Hey, we would like to bring you on to offer advice on your own column for 24 columns or 24 articles based on blank. And that's kind of how we've been invited. I don't know exactly how to tell you how to get in, but I can just tell you mine was by invitation only. So it's because of some level of measured success I've had in some part of my company that one publication may have seen it as a monetary success. Other people have seen it as partnership success. So whatever they've seen it as is how they invite you in to come. A lot of times they also will give you a certain amount of content that they will, are asking you to write. So they'll say, we just want you to write five articles about marketing. Or we want you to write five articles about how to start a car, whatever your expertise is, that's how they invite you. So they'll give you a trial run. They'll give you a date on when they want the first one so they can get an idea if there's an interest there before they move forward. That's a contributing writer. A staff writer is someone who works at that publication and I don't. So as I said before, staff writers are on staff. I don't work at that those offices. So a lot of times when people say, well, can you connect me to whom I need to talk to? I don't work there. I'm not going into a job every day, putting on my blazer, walking into an office every day. That's not it. I have my own company to run. So as a result of having my own company and as a result of having my own things to do, I get the privilege to write. So I've been honored to be invited because of the fact that I, I'm a great writer. I will admit, I'll admit that. And it's something else that I'm going to talk about here in just a second. And then I have shown some level of success. So they invite you in. I'm not the only contributing writer that I can think of that has had that privilege. People like Gary V are contributing writers to every publication. Um, Tony Robbins is a contributing writer. Les Brown has been a contributing writer. Um, you know, they, just name a few. Oprah is a contributing writer to Inc. So there are tons of contributing writers. What I find is very funny is that when people want to get quoted in a piece of content, they won't contact Gary V and say, hey, Gary, <laughs> real quick. Can I get in your article? <laughs> like they don't do that. No, they'll contact people who they think are less busy. And the thing is, every piece of content we publish has the word contributing writer underneath our name. So you know exactly what we are. We are not on staff. We are not a member of the staff. So we can't we can't give you advice on what it's gonna take to to get a staff writer on board with you. So we're not staff writers. We are contributing writers. We have been invited because of something. And again, if you won't do it to Gary V, if you won't contact Tony Robbins, if you won't contact Oprah, if you won't contact Sheryl Sandberg, all of them are contributing writers too. It's, you got to think you're contacting another contributing writer and hoping, hey, she's not that busy. I'm telling you this, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention it sporadically as we go along. All contributing writers have other things to do. We are not going to an office every day. So, uh, you know, when you think that we're not responding, it's because we are quite busy. We have other things going on. We're just, you know, doing our thing, operating our own businesses, living our lives, you know, or at our jobs, whatever it is that we do. And we are not 100% on board. So, uh, you know, 
the ironic part about this is that people have this notion that the only thing that we do is right. And even if you see a lot of content coming out of a contributing writer, that doesn't mean that they just take unsolicited pitches here and there. If you go on my website, you'll see, don't submit any pitches, but people will submit pitches every single day. So you have to memorize this. Contributing writer, staff writer, not the same. Contributing writer has either a business or they're sitting in the C-suite or they have a level of expertise. Maybe they're a doctor, a lawyer. They do something specific and that publication wants their specific expertise. You'll find a lot of doctors and in, in things like the American Medical Journal. They're not, they're not you know, staff writers for them, they are contributing writers. So they contribute white paper and, and staff things. They're like there's a, a lot of different content within that. So just please keep that in mind because contributing writers, we are independent contractors. We don't work for them. We are, that's not our job. So when people are so belligerent and nasty to us and like, well, why aren't you answering my email? I'm like, <laughs> because I don't work there. And um, I'm under no obligation to respond because I get to choose who I want to solicit for a quote. And if that happens not to be you, some of these other things are going to make sense as we go along. So contributing writer versus staff writer. If you want to get in, contact the staff writer. Staff writers will get in contact with us and say, hey, there's somebody out here that we think will be a great match for you to... Um, a great match for you to to talk to about whatever. So, you know, a staff writer would say, hey, we, we want you to uh, talk to, you know, Bob, because Bob is writing some content about something, and we will get in contact with you. We'll definitely find you, but just understand, it's two different things. We're not in the same category. Number two, make a list of contributors and writers, and find out what their specific expertise is. All of us have like about a two sentence sentence underneath our names that tell you exactly what we do. And a lot of times people get this all messed up. They, they got this all messed up. So what they see is they'll see Carol Sankar, founder of the Confidence Factor Public Policy Expert. And then here you go, lining me up and saying, hey, I want to talk to you about tech. <laughs> What are you doing? You can't talk to me about tech. That makes no sense. Why are you talking to me about tech? Because you just want something to stick on a wall. And I completely understand. You want to get in so bad. I got it. But please make sure that when you are pitching to a contributor, it's relevant to what they're doing. Because remember, we are not staff writers. We are contributors. In other words, our expertise in other areas allows us to have this privilege. So if you are just going to contact me randomly and say random things and say, hey, I just want to talk to you because I'm in tech and I want you to write about tech, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing throughout the day um, that keeps the business running to then say, I'm going to talk to you about tech. That's just not how this works. Like today, somebody did that today, today, the 19th of October. Somebody did that this morning. Hey, I see that you um, that you cover great um, tech pieces for entrepreneur. I, I have something I want to pitch to you. Have you ever read my content? My content does not talk about tech at all. And the thing is, because I don't respond, then it becomes a barrage of follow-up emails that like literally takes over my entire inbox. You're not answering. You're not answering. Why aren't you answering? I'm not answering because I don't cover tech and I'm a contributor. I have the right not to answer you because you're not in you're not following what my line of expertise is. My line of expertise, if you look at the byline, it says public policy, women, gender, it says all of that. It tells you exactly what you're getting yourself into. And if it doesn't mirror that, I'm not answering. And I don't have the right to. I don't need to. Because this takes so much time out of my day to then respond to you, then you respond back and respond. And let me tell you something. You won't believe what my inbox, especially on Instagram, looks like on an average day. Hey, I have a great guest that you should be able to feed. Like every day. And it's in no alignment with what I do. It's just that people just want to stick themselves in there so badly. What they'll do is... They'll send anything, and it's not in direct alignment with what I am attempting to accomplish. So please be mindful of this. Read the name and the level of expertise. If you don't fit within that level of
level of expertise, just believe they're not going to respond to you. Why are they not going to respond? I'm glad you asked because it's not what they write about. As a contributor, especially if you are as busy as many of us are, we don't have the time to then take away from what our main focus is to then give honor to something that is not even in our alignment that we have to do research for that may not even be picked up because that's not our normal speak. So I'm, I don't speak tech, right? So I then have to find the words that align with what you want. And you know, a lot of times, let me be very honest. People like to approach contributors because it's free publicity, meaning it's cheaper than going to a publicist, it's cheaper than hiring a firm, and they will annoy the bejesus out of you every day, not understanding, I don't have the time to stop doing what I'm doing because you just want a feature. You have to get this. Don't barrage the person with a follow-up when that's not their normal speak, because then if I were to transform and say, oh, you know what, I'll write about tech, that's fine, I'll do it. And then my editor, who is not a tech expert either, because I got an editor, my editor is in direct alignment with what I do. My editor says, I don't know if this is a good article because we don't speak tech. <laughs> and then they reject it. Now imagine I just spent three, four, five, six hours on a piece of content that gets rejected. Now I have to sit here and be like, I just wasted six hours out of the day. And everybody has this now normative way of speaking. I, I value my time. My time is valuable. Well, don't you think my time is valuable too? If I spent six hours doing something and then at the end of it, I didn't find out it's not worth being published, don't you think that I would be upset as much as you would? Because you're not going to get the feature. And I just spent six hours away from my regular business to tend to your business. Now, I'm not gonna go any further with that. I have to, going back to Maxine Waters, reclaim my time. How do I get that back? I don't get it back. That's six hours of wasted time. So contact writers who are directly within your expertise wheelhouse. Don't just do a random search of anybody, anybody you're connected to and send anybody or any person pitch. If it's not in direct alignment with what they do, there's a high probability they will not respond because you're talking tech, I'm talking gender policy. You're talking, you know, an online sales business and SEO, and I'm talking about, you know, building a car. It's not, people are not going to, we're not going to stop what we're doing to adhere to that. And also, let me also add a little bit, of, like a little bit of, a little understanding on this too. Not only do we have the right not to respond, there's a high probability it won't get picked up anyway. And because of the fact it won't get picked up, most editors are very leery about hearing what you have to say because there's no guarantee that they'll pick it up because they're like three layers ahead of them. So I get the content from you. You say, oh, I'm a great, I build great cars. I then write it, now my editor doesn't speak cars. They gotta find somebody to speak cars. It may fly with that editor. That editor says there's some verbiage and then if they send me back any edits, I'm not doing it. Because again, then that turns into a job and that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do purposeful content that is direct in my wheelhouse and I understand that that may sound a little bit too brash and direct for a lot of people, but it's, it has to be so direct. I'm just in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. I'm not trying to write 800 to 1200 or even 1500 words that you know then don't get picked up then i have to sit with this content and then you're on me like when is the next time you're going to write about that carol when's it and i and i'm sitting here like i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't have an answer for you um no there is no listing of writers and contributors on any publication i've ever worked with um you could just go on the publication and when you go there just when you're looking on the search tab find your your thing. So if you're in tech, there's a tab for tech. If you are in um, if you're in engineering, there's a tab for engineering. If you are in leadership, there's a tab there. Click on it and then you'll start seeing articles right then and there. And when you see those articles, those are the contributors that you're going to see. The top contributors are normally the ones who've done best for the week. So you'll see especially like an entrepreneur, like last week I was at the top of the game because I wrote a piece about negotiating. So if you had went to the negotiating section or what they call the growth, the growth leadership section, 
I was on the top thing. So that that's the reason why so many people are contacting me this week with all kinds of nonsense, because it was the whole week worth of, you know, that growth leadership section. So you'd have to just find out what section works for you. And again, let me also be honest, we all don't know each other. So it gets very cumbersome when people say, well, who do I need to contact in tech? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a contributor. I have no idea. I never met these people. We've met at industry events. We, we may see each other here and there. We may share each other's content, but I don't know them. So I, I don't know who's the best person to tell you. And because all of us have different obligations, either inside or outside of each publication, I can't tell you what their, what their needs are. So you'd have to contact them because uh, we don't work together. We're not we are not in a working relationship. We're like realtors in some senses. You know, I might list a house on B Street, you list a house on A Street. We'll see each other, but it's a high probability that we won't. Um, I don't know who to tell you that lists houses on B Street. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not sure about that. All right, number three. <clears throat> I'm, this is going to be the harshest one. Uh, number three and number six are really bad. Number three, you got to write. You got to write. You've got to post, you've got to post, and you have to record. Now, here was why I say this. I hate the illusion that especially like shows give you around what it takes to get featured. You just call one of us and we just come running. There's a high probability we're not getting on the phone. So if you're waiting to get my phone number and to call me, there's a high probability it won't happen. It is not personal. I just have other things to do. And there's a high probability that we are not going to get on this thing and talk. So for you to get quoted, the easiest way for me to, again, see the long guys coming right now. The easiest way for you to get quoted is to already have publications already out there that I can yield from. So for example, I write, I used to write not as often as I did back in the day, but I used to write a lot more on medium.com. And a lot of my quotes that have been quoted in other publications came from medium. So someone would read something on medium and say, Hey, Carol, I just saw something that you've written about uh, race relations and women in public policy. Can I quote, you know, line number 280? I'm, I'm, I'm in with that. When you have nothing for me to quote and you are waiting for me to give you a call or you are like, hey, Carol, I think it'd be great if you cover, you know, women who lead on B Street. Can we talk about it? I'm like, no, I'm not. And it's not to be it's not to be disingenuous to you. It's just that I don't have the time to make an appointment to talk to you. There's no ROI here because I can't even guarantee that you are actually going to get covered. The best way I can guarantee for you to get covered, if you've got something out there, I'm listening, I'm reading, I'm willing to watch. In other words, if you have a podcast and it's in direct relation to my wheelhouse, send it to me. I'm listening. I'm always looking for new resources. If you have a YouTube channel and you say something directly in my wheelhouse, send it to me. I'm willing to watch. It's directly in my wheelhouse. If you have content that's on Medium or LinkedIn already that is right within my wheelhouse and it's explicitly like really good stuff, send it to me. I'm willing to read. I'm willing to take a look. But I am not willing to get on a phone and people have this grandiose thing where they're like, oh, yes, we could talk tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Well, I can't talk tomorrow at 3 o'clock. And I'm not going to make an appointment for a non-guarantee, right? I don't know if this is going to pick up. So I'm not going to make an appointment, take time out of the confidence factor to go talk to you for 45 to, you know, because then it becomes a picking brain se a session and then it becomes a friendship session. And I have other things to do. And everybody likes to say how much they value their time until when I say what value time looks like, then everybody's like, oh, wow, you don't want to talk to them. No, I don't. I don't do interviews. It's very rare that I'm going to do an interview. So if you really want to get in contact with someone, if you have stuff that's already there and I can kind of take a look at it, and then I can audit it myself and figure out if it works within something I'm already working with. I'll contact you and say, I'm going to quote you. I just saw something you wrote on Medium. For example, there's a, a, an article on Medium that I saw Friday and I saved it. And I'm going to kind of work it in when I get some time. The article is about 2020 is the year of the least ambition. I thought this article was phenomenal. How did I find it? I was on LinkedIn, just not LinkedIn. I was on Medium, just like playing around with some 
some words and then I found this this woman who was talking about how she's feeling like she doesn't feel to be as ambitious this year because of everything that's going on. And when I read it, it was a great op-ed. It was a very long form op-ed. I'm going to quote it. I'm going to quote the person and I'm going to give her credit for that. Now she can say that she has been in Forbes or she's been in Inc. or whichever one I decide to do it for. But it's really going to be dependent on, of course, he's coming now. And now it's going to be really dependent on how the article that I'm writing is going to fit within her expertise. I thought it was a brilliant piece. And I save stuff like that purposely for later on when I'm writing in that wheelhouse, I can go right to that and say, oh man, I remember, um, let's say it's December and I want to do a piece on, you know, how the roundup of 2020 went. I'm going to quote her later on. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing now to go quote it, but I'm just saying later on, I'm going to quote that because it's easier than me sending her an email and saying, hey, can we get on the phone? Because there's a high probability. I don't know if this is going to be picked up. And I'm not going to spend 45 minutes to an hour talking on the phone. It's easier for me to already look at something, listen to something, or read something. It's already done. And then when I'm ready to quote you, I can actually copy and paste it or just write it out and say, I found something that is completely so fascinating. That's the reason why I think people have this idea, why is it that Oprah and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all these people consistently get quoted the same way over and over? You may have to think, like, I got to be one of them to get quoted. Well, not really. Many of them have that much content out there that we will always find ways to quote them someplace. Oprah has a million videos. So if you are feeling down in 2020 and I'm writing a a piece of content about how to be able to boost yourself up in 2020, I can go type on YouTube and go Oprah speech 2020 or something like that. I'm going to find something and then I'm going to quote it. So then it's easier because do you think that if I contacted Oprah, she'll answer the phone? Hey, hey, Oprah, what what you doing tomorrow? Because I'm busy. I'm not busy at three o'clock. Can we talk at three o'clock tomorrow? This is not going to happen. So I don't want to give you the grandiose promise that we're going to get on the phone and we're going to have this interview and it's going to be a okay. A lot of times it is unrealistic to think that a contributor is going to stop what they're doing during the day to be able to talk to you about something specific in that way. So just do yourself a favor. If you have content out there, send it to those contributors. I'm going to also talk to you about other things to send to them, but send it to them. Tweet them. Tag them in a post. It's easier to get their attention when they see that it's already there. All I got to do is read it. All I got to do is listen to it. All I got to do is look at it. Then for me to say, you just hit me up in my inbox and say, I need to talk to you tomorrow. No, you don't, because I'm not going to talk to you tomorrow because I have other things to do tomorrow. So with that, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing to adhere to that. If it's easier for me to say, okay, you've got an article out there. Let me read it. And it doesn't have to be some big publication, Medium and LinkedIn. Start writing. If it's on YouTube, start recording. If you have a podcast, if it's on Anchor, start sharing. Let us hear it. So it's all we have to do is just get it from there. Because if it's in alignment with what we're already doing, it's easier that way. But if you're asking for someone else's time for a chance, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, that. this is where the invisible wall comes in. Like For those of you who are like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it like that. Because I, I thought that you would automatically schedule an interview with me. I cannot, I can't even share with you all of the people, especially on LinkedIn, Can we talk on Friday? Can we talk on Monday? I need to talk to you right now. Give me your phone number. What's your email? I need to talk to you right about. Wonderful. (laughs) And the answer is no. I have a whole other company to run. I don't take unsolicited commentary just because. And it's not a matter of being ignorant or arrogant. It is because I have things that predate your idea. Like you have an idea you just thought about. I have things that predate your ideas. And so often I think it's, like I said, we live in this Insta world where everybody thinks it's Insta. I'm instantly going to contact you and you're Insta going to contact me back and I'm going to Insta get in. Because I can't guarantee that you're going to get in, I'm not going to take the Insta request either because I have no guarantee. I have no guarantee from anyone that I can get you in. All I have is if I had content that you already have, I can pitch that to my editor in a heartbeat because I can say, guess what? I found 
Rose has this article, dot, 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 dot. And then my editor can say, oh, well, you're going to write about that? Yeah. Okay. You know, finish writing about it. Let me see how it looks. And then when I'm finished, if they like it, we go with it. If we don't, if they don't like it, we don't go with it. Either way, somehow it will somehow get out there. Someone will hear about your name, but I'm not going to just do it because I'm just doing an interview just like that. And besides, again, I'm not a staff writer. I'm a contributor. So that means I have the right to determine how I want my column to run. Okay. Because I'm an independent contractor. Keep that in mind. Most of us are. All right. So next is become a resource for a contributor instead of asking to be featured. Become a resource. And what I mean by a resource is when you contact a contributor, before you just say, cover me, I got something great to say, I'm great at it. Before you do that, because that's very forceful, become a resource for that person. In other words, here's how, here's what I mean by resource. A resource is, let's just say you happen to be an expert in fixing cars and I happen to write about car repair. Send me something and say, hey, anytime you're writing a con some content around fixing cars, fixing uh, Japanese cars from 1991 to 1999, I would love to be an expert. I know the entire engine mechanics of cars between 91 and 99, and I would love to be a resource. That's different than saying, I can be, I can write an article, I can be, and it's much different because when you become a resource, what you do is you tell me that you have some level of context that I can look at or some type of expertise based on something and I will keep you, I have a whole other presentation thing that I keep on my own laptop of resources, people who I haven't used yet, but because I haven't written that yet, but when I'm writing about it, I have them in different tab categories. So I don't have to then start thinking, who do I have to go to? So I, if I'm looking for someone who fixes cars between this year and this year, then you will then turn around and, and be in that you know section. Or if I'm looking for someone who knows how to do resume writing or whatever it is, then those people will be in that section. But instead of pushing yourself onto the contributor, the best thing that you can do is to become a resource for that contributor and let them know, I'm not in a hurry. Whenever you're writing content about cars or whenever you're writing content about diversity, whenever you're writing content about finance, I'm here. I'm, I'm anytime you need to. Here are five things that I'm great at, at talking about. I'm great at talking about these five things. Contributors kind of respond to that a little bit easier because you're not asking directly to get on the phone right away. You're not asking for a feature on Friday at four o'clock because people tend to do that. Like they contact you on Monday and by Tuesday, they want to answer. By Friday, they want to follow up. I'm not stopping this company. This company does very well. She's not stopping this company to be able to do three interviews for no reason. But if you said, I'm a contributor, I mean, if you said, I can be a resource. In other words, anytime you need something, here's some things that I have already done. For example, um, I recently met uh, the, the CEO of a vitamin company. That if I said the name and if I could think of it, I could see it. It's in Walgreens, but I can't remember the name of the woman. I don't know why it's not coming to me. Anyway, um, Somehow we, we in our in our alignment, we somehow met. And she says, anytime you want to do a story about how women founders can become unicorns, I would love to be able to have a conversation or give you a few quotes for you. And so I remember I put her in my, my Excel spreadsheet. I says unicorns because I haven't written about that yet. It's been a topic I've been trying to cover, but I haven't had a chance yet. So I put her in my unicorn list, right? And then I followed up with her and I said, thank you so much for, you know, being able to be a resource for me. Um, give me five or six things that, that you want people to know about being a unicorn. So she gave me a few bullet points. Perfect. I haven't, I'm not even close to designing this article yet, but it's in the back of my mind. This has not been a great year to be able to talk about unicorns. It, when I initially met her, it was time to do it. And then all of a sudden COVID hit. And I just didn't think it was good timing to talk about that when women have so many other issues that we're dealing with. But it's been like on the side of my, of my, my ledger, like things to do, women, unicorns. 
that's how to be able to create that. So I'm trying to create it when we have a different environment where we can talk about, you know, the haves and the have nots in a different way. But when she said that, she knew, I, I know she had known about the language. It was like, I'm ready to be a resource anytime you want. Just let me know. I asked her for five or six things. She sends me five or six things. I have it sitting there. It's just not been the right time. So anytime I need something, I know I can send her an email. She'll send me back the responses. And then it'll be easier for me to write the content than for me to get on the phone. Much easier. You wouldn't believe how many great, great features I have done between um, Rahani Day. Um, even I did two interviews with Barbara Corcoran. One was live and one was the same way as a resource. Like it's easier to do it that way than just be like, I need to get on the phone with you. I need, you, you can't guarantee that people will be willing to get on the phone. All right. So become a resource. Ask. Here's the question you ask a contributor beforehand if you want to become a resource. What content are you working on at this time? that you're passionate about? Or what content are you working on right now that is in relation to, and then you talk about their expertise, women and leadership or whatever it is. And uh, honestly, a lot of us, especially me, I'm willing to be transparent. I'm, if, I, if you ask me that right now, I've got seven or eight pieces of content ahead of today, I think. I think about seven pieces of content. None of them have to do with women. So then I'll be like, well, I'm not writing about, ooh, ooh my tripod wanted to drop right now. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that I'm writing about seven or piece, eight pieces of content um, around leadership or something like that. I'll be very transparent with you. I have no problem of, of, with that. But if you're looking for a next Friday feature, I don't have it because I'm about seven weeks ahead of you contacting me. So when I say seven articles ahead, I mean seven weeks ahead. So it, it, there's a possibility you may not get in for eight to 10 weeks if you get in at all. So when you become a resource, you ask like, what are you working on right now? A lot of contributors are willing to tell you what their, uh, what their game is and what they're working on. Or some of us are not working on anything at all. There've been times, especially January through March, I had not published not one single piece of content. I had nothing to talk about. My, my brain was on overload because of you know everything that's going on. I was starting to hear about it from January. So I just had nothing to talk about. So just kind of keep that in mind. Like ask about being a resource. Okay. Question. How many, how much time percentage wise do you devote to content search versus writing versus spending time on your primary business? Do you keep yourself to a writing schedule? No, I don't keep myself to a writing schedule. Again, this is not a job, so I don't keep a schedule. If I feel passionate about something, I get right into it. I dive in and I finish it that day. If I'm not on, if I have something I really want to cover. Like I try to cover right today's events, like a easy, easy, like today, if somebody's talking about, for example, if I'm talking about the, the confidence factor, if somebody's covering um, a piece about women voters, I might cover that today or whatever it is. I don't have a schedule. I'm not that kind of picky, picky person because my business is my main baby. It is the driving force of what makes me happy. I'm not saying writing doesn't. I'm just saying that my business comes first and it's my first passion. Writing has not been my passion, but I'm good at it, but it's not my passion. And it because a contributors, most of us don't get paid, um, it definitely won't be a passion of mine. <laughs> it's a voluntary thing. So I don't keep myself to a schedule. I just do it when I feel like it. So if I feel like talking about you know, the election or um, mothers or whatever it is. Like my last big piece that I just wrote for Entrepreneur was about the motherhood recession. When I feel like it, I get really into it and I go for it. But then if I don't, I don't. Because again, the difference between a contributor and a writer, a writer has to do it. So a writer may have a better answer to that question because they have no choice. Where a contributor, I get the right to do it when I feel like it. And if I'm into something, I will go for it. How effective is responding on Haro or oh, help a reporter out? Um, and I just see that Mark, hello, Mark. Um, Haro is hard, um, but Haro, here's, here's the gift and the curse in Haro. Mo many of those are staff writers. So in other words, I can't personally put out a pitch on Haro because I can't guarantee you a place, if that makes sense. 
Does that make sense? So if I put out something like I'm working on a piece for Entrepreneur Magazine, looking for a resource about women in leadership or leadership in business, I personally, as a contributor, don't have a guarantee that you being a resource in HARO and help a reporter out, if y'all don't know what that means, help a reporter out, I can't guarantee that you will be picked up. A staff writer, on the other hand, has a better idea that if you are going to be picked up based on that. It is a, it's a gift and a curse. The gift is that, yes, you may be able to get in a lot faster. The curse is there's no guarantee. And the other curse is because it's a staff writer, they're going to audit you. So they are going to make sure they're not putting a Bernie Madoff in the finance section. So um, I can't guarantee that. And I, I, don't, I, you, I played the horror game one time um, looking for a resource for Forbes, and that didn't work out the way I had hoped because – you know, people respond and they want in me, like, I want to get in. Like, I remember one time trying to do an article for Forbes and I put out, because Forbes asked me for two resources and I put it out in Haro and my gosh, the amount of people that responded, but the amount of people that consistently followed up, it was a little bit disheartening because I'm like, I can't guarantee you're going to get picked up. So I got to send the quotes over. Can't guarantee that it's going to get in. And people like depend on that. Like I'm going to be in Forbes. I'm going to be in Forbes. And I can't, I don't have any control over that. All I have control over is what I write. Um, what an editor does with the content then becomes their problem. So I, I, there's a gift and a curse in that. You'll be getting a direct editor. You'll be getting a direct staff writer. That That is a guarantee. Many of us cannot. We can't. If we're writing content that is on other publications, but the main three, Forbes, Inc. and Entrepreneur, many of us are not allowed to use Haro to get resources because we can't authenticate them. And I'm again, I'm not the kind of person that's going to take a chance. And then the editor says, no, and I've just sat here for four, five, six hours writing something that's not going to be picked up. What about statistics and case citations? I found it to be a hurdle with some publications, especially think pieces. Um, Statistics, you depending on the publication, they'll tell you exactly where they want you to go for stats. So it gets a little tricky. Some, and again, it also depends on your expertise. Because I deal with public policy, my editor happens to be a public policy professor. So they'll tell you exactly which publications or what statistics they'll want you to use. So it does get a little bit tricky because they'll tell you where you got to stay in between, or they'll just cut those quotes right out and they'll just use the rest of the content. So it, it could go either way. I, I really. Um, every editor is different. So let me be completely honest in answering some of your, your, your question there. We, none of these pub publications are a monolith. And because you don't know what an editor is going to say, you'll be picking at things and looking at stats. And next thing you know, the editor says, that's not, that's not for us. And again, I, I'm just speaking on my behalf. I don't like doing edits. So when I write it, it's better be like good to the bone, ready to go. If they send it back to me and kick it back to me and says, well, we don't like this, we don't like this quote, then I'm not editing it. I'm just going to delete it. I'm not even going to, because it'll take too much time for me to edit to go back. The back and forth between editors is not my thing. Because again, I got other things to do. So if they say, oh, it was okay, but we didn't like that quote, I'm not doing it over. I'm not, I'm, I'm just not. Um, because again, the editor will make you work on it again and then you resubmit it and they don't like something else. It, 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 it's a, it's a flag and I'm not going to do it. That's just me. Um, the early bird wins. Yeah. Mark, ironically about Haro, you got to be the first one to respond. Usually within, by the time the fifth response is up, it's done. Um, and so anything after that, it gets a little dicey, but again, I've had bad luck with Haro. I've gotten people, contacting me, harassing me, bullying me. I mean, you know, it gets a little tricky. People get real personal because they want that feature so bad. But then because you can't guarantee it, it gets, it's like, how could you be arrogant about something I don't control? But because they see a name, because they see a publication, they see an opportunity, they're like, man, I'm in. And I'm like, no, I can't guarantee that. And the thing is, I don't know how many of you have ever used Haro on the side of, um, looking for um, sources. 
as a journalist, a lot of times horror will actually take out the part where you say, I can't guarantee this feature will run. Usually we're supposed to put a disclaimer in there, they take it out. And so it makes people think that the moment they pitch, they're getting access to you. So a lot of times we, we, we make ourselves anonymous. We don't say exactly the publication, but we have to tell horror what publication it is. And then people will get angry if they don't get a response. And I'm like, Mm, that, that's not good. <laughs> not good at all. So um, no, I I don't I don't necessarily subscribe to the Haro thing. Um, only if I have to, like if I, and I have to clear it with my editor first. If my editor says it's okay for me to go down the Haro route, but I hate doing that because again, I have the backlash of people who just I want to get in and they they're just thinking about themselves 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 and it gets a little funky. I, I'm not into that. All right, I'm going to talk about the most controversial piece of um, our conversation today before I go. So um, there are a lot of, uh, hmm, how do I say, you know, I always say English is my second language. So how do I say this? Um, there are a lot of ways to get in and pay to play. And I think that if you have been around in your level of expertise long enough, somebody has offered you an opportunity to pay to play. And when I say pay to play, I'm not talking about publicists, for instance. I'm going to talk about publicists in another conversation. I don't have room in here to talk about publicists because publicists come in all different forms from ratchet to horrible to disgusting to great. Like it's all over the place. You got to, we'll talk about that another day. And so, the one thing is the pay to play model is is very is very disheartening. And I have been victim to all of that in the past trying to get ahead what I thought was ahead. Because like many people I thought there was some brick wall that I couldn't bust through and I couldn't figure out how to you know had all this expertise and all this knowledge and I couldn't get it where I needed it to go or where I wanted it to go. And so I had fallen for some pay to play models. I remember one time this lady contacted me. It was like, I can get you a 700 word feature for 1500 bucks. And I never did it, thank God. But not too long after that, and this is me just sharing some story with you. I was on a talk show and I was in the green room before my appearance on the talk show. And I was sitting there with the former, uh, uh, the former editor for Forbes Women. She's no longer there. I happen to have known her beforehand, but I didn't know her know her. And this is the first time I've seen her in person. So we're sitting in the same room. We're just chopping it up. We're having a great time. And I leave, she leaves. I don't think about it too much after that, at that time. I wasn't in Forbes yet. I hadn't started writing for Forbes. But before that, I had been featured in Forbes in 2017 for um, my expertise around diversity. So when we met um, later on that year, if not 2018, when we met in the studio, I didn't think about even pitching or asking. I was just, you know, I'd seen her on other things before and I was just, you know, happy to be in her space. So we, we had a great conversation. I was in New York that week. My mom lives in New York. I'm from New York, but I had to go because literally I was on the show and I had to catch a flight like in three hours. So I came to do the show and leave. So. I said to her, when we when I come back to New York, we got to chop it up. And we were talking, da, 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 so, you know, left, whatever. A few months later, um, somebody pitches me an idea to do the Forbes Coaches Council. This is the biggest mistake of my professional career. And I'm, I'll admit it today. It, I wasn't, I wasn't going to admit it then. Because I had already made inroads with Forbes. And then I don't know what happened. I think I, I took my own U-turn the wrong way because... I had been, I'd already had some level of success with Entrepreneur and Inc. And there was a conflict of interest with another publication I was working with at the time. And I figured that to supersede that conflict, let me pay to play. So I did the Forbes Coaches Council thing against my better judgment. Shortly after that, it just so happened, I'm telling you, the universe is so small. I went back to New York for something else. And I happened to run into the same editor again. And we were talking and she was like, are you writing for Forbes yet? And I said, no, well, yes, well, I'm writing for 
the Forbes Coaches Council, and she looked at me when she had this look, like her whole face changed, like turned purple. She's like, why'd you do that? And I said, well, I have a conflict because of another publication I'm writing for. And she was like, look, let's have a meeting. We had a meeting. We talked. We did this other thing. And then I find out what I really got myself into. And shortly thereafter, when I had a chance to really analyze what Forbes Coaches Council was, because I didn't know at the moment, I hadn't even written anything for them yet. I was so like, ugh, like beside myself. Um, because essentially paying to play meant that I was in a sea with people who were underqualified. And so here I am trying to get further up and supersede something that is a conflict of interest, thinking that by paying, I can just overlook that. Can't do that. So when I'm in this publication with these, with people who are not at my level, and I don't mean it in any disrespect, but they just didn't think like me and I asked immediately to get out of this agreement, I realized how far back that actually took me. Because at that moment, I was pitching to have my own column in the Wall Street, not the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. And that's the reason why I did it that way. And long story short, when I started looking at the quality of content that was coming out of the Forbes Coaches Council, I was so hurt by how much money I had spent to be in a publication that was not gonna get me anywhere. And a lot of you have probably encountered people who claim to be in Forbes or any of these other publications where they pay to play, they get in, and then you're like, why is my column not doing well? Well, when you pay to play, the initial publication doesn't put any money behind it. That's the reason why the Huffington Post or, or HuffPo um, stopped doing the, um, they stopped accepting submissions from outside people. It's the exact same reason. They had people that were paying to play and then the quality of the content went so far down, they had to just rehydrate some other stuff and try to figure out a way to get out of their own way. And for so many of you, if you're, you're in a place where you're trying to get around certain things or try to hurry up the process and you decide to pay to play, it's the quality of where you're going that's going to matter. So. I say this, and I say this with a great deal of respect. My experience um, with doing that took me somewhat out of the running for the New York Times for a moment, and I had to start the process all over again because the quality of what I was in did not match the quality of what I was going for. And so it didn't look one and the same. For all of you who are struggling with that because you want to be featured so bad, you're willing to pay to play you're not gonna get any press behind it and you're not gonna put any money behind it. I can tell you now Forbes puts no money behind the Forbes Coaches Council. So for those of you who have been featured in a piece of content that is from Forbes Coaches Council and you're wondering, why is nobody else publishing my stuff? Why is it not moving ahead? Because most people don't want a Forbes Coaches Council piece. I'll even tell you, I've interviewed celebrities from Ryan Serhant to Barbara Corcoran to Cheryl Sandberg and many others, many of them won't give you an interview if you're in the Forbes Coaches Council. They they will not. Um, yeah, there is no Google just Forbes Coaches Council. They will not give you an interview. So if you call and say, hey, Cheryl, I want an interview. And I, I have a direct contact with Cheryl Sandberg. Trust me, she won't give you the interview if it's in Forbes Coaches Council. You better say Forbes and you better say Forbes editorial. If it's anything different, they won't give it to you. So if you want to get quoted, and somebody from Co Forbes Coaches Council says, I want to give you an interview. And you're so desperate. You're like, oh, my God, I can't wait. I want to be in Forbes. And then you find out that this is the Forbes Coaches Council. I am not disrespecting Forbes Coaches Council at all. Everybody has to get in how they feel. But if you're looking for main stage credibility that is going to pay you long term, you're not going to get it there. So just be very careful what you pay to play in because you might get played in the end. It is really hard to recoup the investment from some of these pay to play opportunities. True story, many years ago, I remember someone asked me to pay to play 15 grand to get into the Harvard Business Review. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I kept like, oh my God, it's only $15,000. I can, I can do this, I can do this, I can. And I, I don't know what it was. Like my, my heart wasn't into it. And I kept thinking, you know, but this is my way in and, you know, people will take me seriously. And 
it just so happens that I waited it out and delayed a little bit of my own gratification and Harvard Business School called me and I went and spoke at Harvard Business School. And then I was quoted by the Harvard Business Review. It was easier that way than if I had paid him the 15 grand and then it didn't go anywhere because people that want to pay to play don't ever get the credibility that you're looking for. And now mind you, there are people who I know who have paid that 15 grand to that particular gentleman who is some, he's lingering right here on LinkedIn right now. I know who he is. I'm just not going to say names. And then he takes that money, puts it in his pocket, gives you nothing in return for it. Because now you're just happy that you have the word HBR behind you, but you don't know that it'll never uh, move up the ranks in Harvard. They know who, who that person is. They just can't get him off the platform that easily. And so all of that is a money play. So just be mindful that paying to play is not necessarily going to work. The only people you might want to pay to play if you don't feel like doing all of this that I just said here today is a publicist. And that's another conversation that we're going to have hopefully next week. I can't do it tomorrow. I was like, oh, we could do this tomorrow. No, we can't. I can't. I'm booked tomorrow. Um, but maybe next week we'll talk about publicists because the role of the publicist is going to be important if you can't navigate this on your own. But you got to know what kind of publicist you're getting yourself into because some of these publicists will take your money and give you a world of hurt in return for your investment. And you'll be sitting around here like, Carol, why can't I get in still? Because you don't have a good publicist behind you. Um, can you submit the same content to several publications at once, given the lag time? Uh, the, 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 it not, it's not necessarily a good idea because some of the publications know each other. So, for example, Ink and Fast Company are owned by the same person. The same editor who is on the byline I used to be on before I got on this byline at Ink is also the editor at Fast Company. So if you hit both of them up, they're going to know. Um, Entrepreneur and Forbes have a direct relationship, so you might not want to do that either. They actually happen to be in the same building, one floor above one another. Um, and Ing and Entrepreneur also sometimes have a little bit of relationship. So it's better to give it at least a week before you submit and also understand that no four or five of them write the same. So the list, I can never say this, and it's because of my, my, my proper Patois accent, the list sickle is a great approach for ink, but on entrepreneur, they want story. On Fast Company, they want editorial. And on Forbes, they want quoted content with um, direct resources. So if you keep pitching the same content over and over again, and let's just say it's a list sickle, um, and you pitch that to Ink, Ink doesn't respond, and then you pitch it to Forbes, there's a high probability you're not going to go anywhere with that because they don't even take list sickle articles like that any longer. Um, so you just have to know which one you're pitching to. You have to know how to rehydrate that content in different forms where, like I said, Ink is not into the story form content. They are into how many ways? Five ways to break your toe. Where Ink, I mean, uh, Entrepreneur is into long form resourced story form content, fast companies into editorial. You're just going to find which one is different. And again, before you pitch a story, learn how to get quoted first. It's easier to get in if you want to pitch a story because of a quote than it is to pitch a story and hope that they'll actually let you in. It is much easier to say, I've been quoted here before, let me in. That editor would look for you that quote to see how good that article did because they're gonna see if the article was a result of your quote or if it was a result of something else. And then they'll give you the opportunity, which is so much different than blindly sending it to anybody. Okay. All right, I gotta go. I have things to do. <laughs> I spent an hour with you. I told you I was gonna stay some time with you. Um, next time we meet, let's just try to talk about publicists because then if this is not for you, if doing all this measure of work is not for you, then let's talk about you getting a publicist and what you need to look for in a publicist. And the best part about this conversation that you and I are about to engage in is because I'm not a publicist, I know exactly what to look for because I got a Rolodex full of publicists and I only take, I only give people my real phone number that do real high quality work. And I can tell you what they do differently than other publicists who really, <sighs> 
<laughs> and mind you, it's the ones who can't get you in that somehow charge more than the ones who can. And I'm always fascinated by that. I'm like, wait a minute, you charge $10,000 a month and you can't get them in? And this other person over here who can get them in only charges $1,000 and th that's the person you've chosen? I don't get it. We'll talk about that on our next meetup. But I hope I've answered as many of your questions as I could. But I just want you to, I want you to get out of the space of non-credibility, especially as we're in COVID. Credibility is going to matter. It's going to matter profusely um, because when this is all over and this is all said and done, it's the people who have that level of credibility that are going to get to the next level when this is all said and done. Because I always say, look, if it wasn't for where I stand with the privilege that I have been afforded, um, I don't know where I'd be because my business is still doing very well because of the fact that I'm, I'm in this position where I can still get press coverage and still give press coverage. It's, it's a really great dynamic to be in. So for anybody who's telling you this is not important, I'm like, yeah, stay away from them. Just stay away from them. Don't listen to them. <laughs> stay away from them because this is important, especially at a time when we can't get together, we can't convene, we can't say we're in, in front of an audience of 10,000 people. If you can get 10,000 eyes on you, that's a good look, right? Anyway, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to go, but it was great being with you today. Hope you've learned something from this. And if you have any questions, post below. I'm always reading and I'm always responding. I'll see you.